The headlines tonight, NATO annulled after delegate swallows treaty. I'm so sorry yells exploding cleaner and bearded cleric in oily chin insertion. Those are the headlines. God, I wish they weren't. Gets tonight. News presenter sacked in attempt to sell house to David Owen. 75,000, would that be enough, do you think? And spiders will never speak, insists Ambassador. I don't think so myself. Uh, I should be very surprised if they did, did it in public, and I should be equally surprised if they did it in private. There's growing evidence this evening that suspects held in police cells are being eaten by police. This report from Ted Maul has that story. Four men vanish overnight from a Reading police cell. The next detainee complains of a drain blocked with caked blood and pieces of fat on his floor. A drunk man in Chatham is banged up for the night and has his arm punched full of holes. He says the police tried to fill his arm with garlic. Just part of an increasingly muscular body of evidence, that say activist, proves that suspect eating is on the increase and that the increase is getting rapid. The best evidence of all is this, a Bow Street bastard. A special truncheon used for beating suspects which tears out cubes of flesh small enough to fry. Activist Harkin Petty says this is just one piece of evidence of suspect eating from a huge list in his head. And it's nonsense. Unexplained disappearances from police cells have doubled in the last year. Records show suspects are regularly weighed and smeared in oil. But police say this is just standard practice for young offenders. Campaigners are calling for immediate action. Without it, they say, thousands of suspects across the country could be eaten tonight by panicking policemen. It's just been announced... Yeah, thanks. It's just been announced there's to be a special inquiry into the government's handling of the Froome shipping deal which flew to pieces last month amid accusations of gross ministerial misconduct. Our economics correspondent, Peter O'Hanrahan, is with the Minister for Ships, Michael Crane. He's just prized him out of an emergency meeting. I'm with the Minister for Ships, That's Michael what, Crane. That's everything MP. I've just said comes He's spewing straight back out of his stupid meeting. slab of a face. Mr Crane, choppy waters for the government. Not at all, Peter. Um, this procedure was entirely proper, and I think the inquiry will prove that the government's handling of this matter was entirely proper. So the government's ship back on course? Absolutely. Back to you, Chris. Peter, what the hell was that? This man's made a big-scale cock-up here. You let him get away with it. Now let me speak to him. Put your earpiece next to his head and stand still. Now, Minister, there's reason to believe that you lied to the House. How do you answer that? Well, that is a very serious and unfounded allegation, and I'll be making a statement to the House based on the preliminary inquiry next week. A week is a long time in politics. Rab Butler. Shut up, Peter. Now, Minister, did you or did you not lie to the House? I will be making a full statement to the House next it's week. It's a simple question, yes or no. Did you or did you not lie? I, um... As the Minister for Ships sprawls on the pin, it's back to you, Chris. No, it isn't, Peter. He's about to answer the question. He's about to admit to lying to the House. You've let him get away again. Where's he gone? Over there. Well, get him back. He's in a cab. Peter, you've lost the news. What are you going to say? Sorry. Look like you mean it. Look down at the ground and say sorry. I'm sorry. Peter, next time you cross the road, don't bother looking. Sorry. Travel now from Valerie Sinatra in her pod, a mile above the centre of Great Britain. Valerie, talk me some road. Well, you're gagging for it, Chris, so uh, here yeah, it goes. Yeah, yeah. The M4 between Reading and London is still solid. That's due to the lorry driver having shed his skin across three lanes, so watch out for oily patches there. The M40 southbound still slow due to that earlier large accident. Police reckon they should have finished bagging and labelling everything by about midnight.
Meanwhile, mobile vehicle crushes are in operation in Cardiff on red line routes. So if you're illegally parked there, they will crush your car to the size of a Satsuma and simply hand it back to you. I love Satsumas. Well, so do I, Chris, but I don't think I'd like to drive one. Yeah, but I bet if you did, you'd do it really well. <laughs> Finally, a look at the capital, which is London. Worse than ever tonight, I'm afraid lots of cars on Oxford Street being slowed down by their own lights. So uh, I'm afraid your fast, speedy sports car, no use to you at all tonight, Chris. Thanks very much indeed, Valerie, and I'm sure Alan will agree she certainly is one for a fast car. She certainly is. Um, I prefer something a little bit more comfortable myself. Oh, well, with me, Alan, it's comfort and speed every time. Well, a fast car's a safe car. Of course, in the States, we drive a whole lot slower than you guys. Actually, I think statistically, slower cars are actually more dangerous. Yeah, but you can't be saying we should get rid of the speed limits. No, 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 no. Now the sport with Alan Partridge. Thanks, Chris. And it's a special desk of sport this week as we look forward to all the sporting action that will take place in this year's 1994 World Cup finals in America in Alan Partridge's World Cup countdown to 94. Goal! Yes, 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 yes! Let was a goal. Goal! Striker! He has what? And another! Bing bang stick it in. Thank you and good night. Flat! That was liquid football! Uh. Shit! Did you see that? He must have a foot like a traction engine. Goal! Well, it's going to be three weeks of non-stop action, and to help us along, and add a little bit of colour and uh, fun to the proceedings, I've got with me a soccer meter. What's that, Alan? Well, I'll tell you, it's very simple. It's to explain the group system. Now, first of all, all these long arms here, these long signposts, are the, the venues where the matches will be played. Dallas, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and so on. If you look at me from above, you can see that these, these are the group, this is the group system. Um, the, the, it, it's 14 groups, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N. And um, there, there are four rounds. There's round one, the red round, yellow round, blue round, red round again. Those are my, that's my colour coding, not FIFA's. You won't find that with FIFA, just with me. So... That's, that's the basis of it, and as you can see, they get progressively let fewer towards the centre, the ultimate goal being the World Cup. All right, let's take an example. OK, ra round one ah, is Pasadena. Let's say it takes place in Pasadena between Chile and, and Paraguay, something like that. OK, and then we're through to round two, which is, San, let's say it's San Francisco. We've not got much time here. San Francisco, and that goes through to Orlando. So let's take it round to Orlando there. Let's move those out of the way. Where's San Francisco? Where's... Right, just going to find San Francisco. Where is it? There it is. Right. So San Francisco have played, played Orlando, and then we're through to round three, Los Angeles. It's not written. It's, <laughs> it's this. It's not written on that side. It, sh it should be, but it's bloody not. <laughs> and then, it's whoever went that that then we're through to the final and the World Cup. Who was that going to be? Goal! The proof is in the pudding, and the pudding in this case is a football. Booth, eat my goal. The goalie has got football pie all over his shirt. I'm Alan Partridge, and that will be my World Cup 94. You can come too. Join me. Thanks, Alan. More sport from you later. Absolutely, Chris. With a bit of luck, we'll have Sandy Lyle on the line. America now. Oh. If you have a baby in the States, you may well be in for a bit of a surprise when they yank it out. <laughs> Barbara Wintergreen reports. San Spirito, California, where Americans keen to brew but too busy to breed pay for a prosthetic pregnancy. This is a natus, a plastic disc implanted inside the womb which expands to give the sensation of labor without being sentenced to children. 
And there, there she is. Can you see her at the top Hi, there? Honey. There she is. Say hello. Hi, honey. That's lovely. The Cervico substitute is the Formica brainchild of doctors Bill McVitie and Mortimer Marcus. Isn't that extraordinary? Starts out like that, it ends up like that. Nice? Within the woman's body. Absolutely. Comes out just like this. Woo! At this fallopian factory, people come for a credit card conception. The price includes labor and delivery, and there's a hefty surcharge on the discharge. Among the thousands of proxy parents forking out for this flexible fetus are Anton and Lally Sampson. We've really worked hard at, uh, you know, we've given him his own room, he's got his Bon Jovi posters, you know, uh, Sharon Stone, the Red Sox. But divorcing Americans are causing courtroom chaos in custody battles for their beloved disc. And outside the Natus Institute, Women's League protester Taya Peachman leads a womb vigil against synthetic siring. I believe you've been smashing Nadai, is that true? Yeah, we have Nadai smashing by the side of the road to try and de-encourage the women who come in here thinking that they want their thing in their womb and they do, do not. They can spend their money, but they should just remember that they're women and they have a right to live and to breathe. That's the beauty of the whole Nadis thing, is that if a woman wants the pain, if she wants to scream, if she wants to bleed, she can. If, however, she just wants it to pop out like... Uh, a bar of soap. Like a bar of soap. Then she can have that option too. So it looks like this is one reproduction line where a plastic and placenta go hand in hand. Barbara Winnegreen, CBN News at the Natus Institute, San Spirito, California. The day today, because fact into doubt won't go. And we've just heard that areas in three of Britain's biggest cities are being evacuated due to suspect dogs. Police believe this could be the start of a mainland campaign of dog bombs threatened by the IRA last month. This report from Eugene Fraxby has got the story with him, reports. Oxford Street in London with three policemen and a knotted tape barrier. A stray dog was spotted here an hour ago and everybody ran out. Police then isolated the area containing the dog and told the public to clear off. Later, they located it and conducted a controlled explosion. But as the remains were being taken for laboratory tests, a second dog ran out from the crowd. It could have been a bomb. The police had no choice. It was over in seconds. A dog and three people dead from guns. Being old, they would have died soon anyway. But the dog, which contained no explosive at all, was shot to ribbons in its prime. By six o'clock this evening, a monument had been built, marking the end, perhaps, of the relationship between man and dog, which today went from this to this. The only way police can neutralize bomb dogs is to spray them with a resin coating which hardens instantly to contain any explosion. The inside of the bomb dog is obviously destroyed, but the outside stays the same shape. However, if the underside is not covered, a highly directional blast launches the animal vertically to a height of over a thousand feet. Coming up. New explosive sus laws mean any domestic dog is now a potential hazard. And an eyewitness who was caught up in more bomb dog chaos. Shooting one policeman in particular I saw, it went, No! <coughs> and one guy, I don't know whether he was involved or not, was running away. He went, <coughs> and he caught him one more time between the eyes, it was horrible. He went, <coughs> Um, that, that was as much as I saw, really. Seven more dogs have gone off in the last ten minutes. Eugene Fraxby. The four hounds exploded in central London without warning. All within yards of government buildings. The Prime Minister put on a brave face, but for many like Tory whip Peter Goodright, the time for calm words is over. An absolute f***ing disgrace. These inhuman, shit for souls suckers have no place here. In my considered opinion, they are c Journalist Back David the Meller the added little of interest. An insolent contempt for public opinion. And for junior health secretary Paul Mann, words alone could not express his anger. 
Police are on the alert again this evening and have cordoned off a man in Piccadilly. It's believed he may have eaten a suspect dog last night and could now go off himself. Sinn Féin have so far denied they are backing the campaign. Earlier today I spoke to their deputy leader, Rory O'Connor, who under broadcasting restrictions must inhale helium to subtract credibility from his statements. So what's your initial statement? These incidents are inevitable given the position of the British government. You do support this campaign then? The IRA have been forced into this position. So you do support this campaign of violence? The IRA... Sinn Féin is a legitimate political party. Which supports terrorist action. Your tone is antagonistic and you're making me very angry. And since we conducted that interview, all sides in the conflict have had a meeting and have sorted everything out. The day to day is now available in these fine locations. The night sky over Paris. The International Hackenbacker Building in Chicago. The wall of Cheops Pyramid at Giza. And the handles of 400 million petrol pumps across the globe. The huge success of the BBC's new soap opera, The Bureau, has now spread to Italy. They've got a daytime discussion show there devoted entirely to it. It's called Bello Buretti and its stars are the wagging tongues of hosts Carmen Alzo and Pucazina McRae. So much for the Euro Bureau. Meanwhile, back here in Britain, a nation holds its breath tonight for the 2000th edition. Nothing. Why did they do this to me? Just because I'm gay. I'm gay. I'm gay. What? It's Guy, Mr. Hennity. He's been attacked. Yeah, I know. What did you say? I said I'm gay. You're fired. What? I'm warning you, Jack Hennity. If Guy goes, we all go. Yeah. 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 Go on then, walk. The lot of you walk. I've got people queuing up to work inside this bureau de change. Right. Right. I'm going. Me too. I don't even work here. Yeah, go on, you go and all. But just you remember what you said. see myself as an, an individual human being needing salvation, receiving it through the work of Jesus Christ. Do you find the day-to-day -day comes into this at all? Well, how can it not? It is day-to-day. -day. Every day, the day-to-day? -day. Every day, day-to-day, -day, yeah. For you? Yes. And with a bit of luck for all these people? That's what one prays for, what one would like to see. You would like to see the day-to-day -day for all these people today? Um, if your prayer was answered? That they should each enter into an experience of personal salvation. Which would include the day-to-day? -day. Well, how could it not? I don't know what, what kind of salvation you could be talking about that wouldn't include the day-to-day. Environation from me, Rosie May. 
An international ban on the hunting of waves has finally been introduced. Waves have been used for centuries to pull cars in small countries, but are now facing extinction. Over a million specially farmed waves are to be released into the wild this winter. Man has finally harnessed the cooling power of worms to drive a fridge. The worms inhabit an internal piping system cooling everything as they go. Cramming in more worms lowers the temperature. Worms. I'm Rosie May. My milk is green. Come drink me. Tomorrow, the Home Office release a new series of videos designed to help young people with everyday problems. They're produced in association with the day-to-day, -day, and this is the first. Salted! 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 Yeah! Salted! Hello, I'm Graham. And I'm Crispin. And today we're going to show you how to deal with a relative yeah. who's just died in your house. Let's go. Oh, look. Dad's dead. Oh, bugger. Hello, Dad. Are, Are you dead? dead? Right then, what you'll need is some vinegar, an oven glove, two ping pong balls, Fresh books, some butcher's grass, super glue, some bungee, a salad spinner, and a chisel. One chicken chisel and a packet of fresh blade. First, embalming. A cup of vinegar, a bit of shoe polish on the wrists, and inject the corpse thoroughly with fresh. Now he's ready for a coffin. But don't forget, wash your hands. It's the end of your day. Now he's unburied. No, he's not. Leave her up a nearby paving stone. Scratch on the name. <laughs> on the stone. So Pim can see what's in the ground. And make way for the priest. For your bouquet, stick your chisel into your salad spinner. Plunge it into the mound. <laughs> Flowers. <laughs> Salted. Unless, of course, you're a Muslim. <laughs> Now with the rest of today's news, Chris, thanks, it's 8 o'clock, this is the day to day. The main stories so far, the Libyan leader Colonel Gaddafi has plunged southern Europe into crisis by kidnapping Crete and towing it to a secret location off the Libyan coast. Crowds in Tripoli welcome the news, a delighted Gaddafi waving like a girl. Libyan tugs stole Crete at 2 o'clock this morning. At first, the natives, aided by strong winds, were able to haul it halfway back. But then they lost grip, the island was towed to the North African coast and hidden underwater. The Lincolnshire village of Fladney is tonight recovering from a gravity quake during which the Earth's pull was reversed for seven minutes, sending everything not secured onto the ground over a mile into the air. The quake struck at 4.30 this afternoon. These pictures were taken by Paul Cork, who had his Polaroid with him when he fell up into the roof of a shed. This man survived by clinging onto a boot scraper. Others were not so lucky. I was playing football with my cousin, just in the garden there, and uh, he jumped up to catch the ball and, and just kept going. His cousin later rained back onto the ground along with 4,000 other villagers. The American space shuttle Endeavour 4 sets off tonight on its special stunt mission. Once in orbit, it will hurtle towards a NASA space ramp, fly off the end and leap over a line of 12 other shuttles. It will then return to Earth tomorrow afternoon at half past three. It's time now for our resident humorist, Brandt, the physical cartoonist from the Daily Telegraph, to bloody the noses of the great and good. Mr. B... Make us smile about the bad things in the world. This week, I've been looking east, where Chris Patton, like King Kong, has made a monkey of himself over Hong Kong. An old man stands naked in front of a mirror, eating soup. He is a fool. Jacques-Jacques Livereau, a brilliant man and a surprisingly nice one, too. Now, it's easy to tell if somebody's dead, but how can you tell if you're dead? Some people have lived to tell the tale in a short film we've made. Lucy Turner-Warwick is a boxing trainer in High Wycombe. 
She had a near-death experience when in a coma induced by a pupil. A I learned later that I had actually died. My heart stopped for, I don't know, a few seconds. I could see a tunnel, and at the end of that tunnel, a very, very bright light. I was aware of, of a figure standing at the end where the light was. She led me into an open plan office, and at the back there was this little separate office, and she beckoned me towards it, and on the door it, it said God. And there was a man, very nice, friendly man, in a suit, grey hair, and I sat down and we chatted a bit. He was very jokey and jolly, and I remember he had a little sign behind his head that said, um, it was one of those, you know, you don't have to be mad to work here, but it helps or something. So I thought, well, he's obviously got a sense of humour. Anyway, we talked and then he pointed to another man in a suit with a beard and said, that's my son. And I looked back at God and he laughed and said, um, it's a family firm, you know. Um, and it, it was very, very friendly, but, but very boring. I'm afraid all of these people that talk of these out-of-body experiences are basically congenital liars. Sean Clear Gardsley is Professor of Psychosociology at University College London. He is a sceptic. We have a whole catalogue of examples of hospitals actually manufacturing out-of-body experiences whereby they attach patients to wires and actually lift them up towards the ceiling, therefore creating in the patient a feeling of lift, literally lifting out of their bodies. In laboratory experiments, scientists artificially created near-death experiences in mice. They fired hungry mice against a wall with a specially calibrated gun. Food was placed on a shelf above the comatose mice. If they had a soul, it would leave the mouse's body, float upwards and eat. The results showed that afterwards, the mice felt as if they had just eaten. More proof was provided by the out-of-body experience of Leslie Safrat. I, I could actually see myself coming out of my mouth as vomit, but it wasn't just as vomit, it was like as vomit in a dress. And then I woke up and I was a woman. I went into my experience as a man, but left it as a woman. Something definitely happened, but I don't know what. So how do you explain the case of Keith Phillips, who returned from his out-of-body experience as a woman. He didn't. But we filmed it and there's an awful lot of evidence to show that that's the case. No, there isn't. Do you believe in God? Oh, yes. And I liked him. I like him. I love him, but I don't want to go and... I don't want to go and work for him. Not yet. An optimist sees half a pint of milk, he says, it is half full. A pessimist sees half a pint of milk, he says, it is half empty. I see half a pint of milk, I say, it is sour. No time for anything but the weather, a lot of snow around, pretty grim out there, isn't it, Sylvester? Yes, Chris, most of Britain will be waking up tomorrow to a carpet of white dung. Thanks, mate. And that's it. No time left for the headlines. That's the day today. Nine o'clock, BBC Two, tomorrow night, we'll start again. Until then, thanks very much for watching. Just remains for me to wish you a very good night. Join us again tomorrow night for a full resume of the day's events, the sport, the business, the weather, and the very latest changes in the world of politics. Same time, 9 o'clock tomorrow evening on BBC Two. That's the day today, keeping you abreast of the very latest changes in local, national, and international news. Prepared to break the flow of the programme if necessary to accommodate footage of unfurling events. Often live packaged by field reporters on the hoop. Those who know that news is paramount, and only the most recently hatched news egg is any currency at all. Football matches.